this presentation, Managing Disruptive Behavior in the Home and School Settings. We're going to briefly introduce ourselves. I'm Patty Doran. I'm an Associate Professor of Special Education at Towson University, and I'm also, uh, and I'm also the mom of three children with pandas. Order, but. <laughs> I'm Heather Pennlocker, and I uh, was a behavior specialist in the Bellingham School District, um, and I am the mom of one child with hands, and I quit my job so I could be home to care for my child, and my um, cognitive behavioral therapy lens was shattered, and I have a very different uh, view on managing behavior in the home. I'm Jan Tona. I'm a pediatric occupational therapist. I'm the parent of two now adult children, one of whom has pans. Um, my lens was also shattered. Uh, I love that. I love that saying. And uh, and so I'm I'm happy to be here with um, with Patty and Heather to talk with you. When we put this together, I just want to tell you we were concerned about coming off as being kind of like, you know, we know what you're supposed to do as parents. You're doing everything wrong. So we want to just really start this by saying we're we're going to offer you some ideas to maybe add to your toolkit as parents we're not saying that whatever you're doing isn't right or the best that you could do i don't think any of us was raised in a family with a child with pans necessarily maybe we were but maybe it wasn't identified and really the parenting skills that we tend to use are the skills that we observed growing up that's what we always fall back on right in times of stress i open my mouth and my mother comes out so <laughs> recognizing that we just want to add some some different tools to, to your toolkit that might be helpful as you navigate these waters. Really what we wanted to accomplish today was to talk a little bit about some of the things that may set our children off in terms of being triggers or antecedents to behaviors. Talk about ways that we may reinforce those intentionally or unintentionally. And again, as Jan said, with the understanding that there are days as a panda's parent that your goal is just to get through the day in one piece and you are going to make a lot of compromises and trade-offs and that's okay. But there are also days when things are a lot more stable and you wake up and you say, you know what, we're ready to work on some things. And so this presentation is a little bit about we're ready to work on some things, and it's a little bit about what do you do on those other days? How do you keep the crisis from getting to a boiling point? Um, so I'm going to also talk pretty quickly through these next slides because I think the information that Jan and Heather are providing it may be more new. I suspect that many of us who have been through the uh, CBT merry-go-round um, could recite what's on these slides by heart in terms of what behavior is like and how we analyze behavior. We do want to start by differentiating between what we call challenging behaviors and neurological symptoms. I think oftentimes uh, our school, our therapy, our other professionals that we work with may have a little bit different lens. And part of what's important with children who may have pandas is to be able to differentiate between something that is truly a neurological symptom and outside anybody's control and really inflammation neurologically driven, such as a tick, such as a motor abnormality, um, and a behavior that may also have its genesis in neurological inflammation, but sometimes may also persist and remain um, and be learned over time. And so when we talk about neurological symptoms, we're talking about things like tics, emotional lability, motor abnormalities. When we talk about challenging behaviors, we're talking about rituals, separation anxiety, aggression, rage, and opposition. And then we have some things that fall in between like rage, sensory issues, food restriction, that sometimes can be learned behaviors, may have their genesis in that overnight abrupt onset of behavioral change. You may see some boxes here throughout, recognizing that we're not gonna have as much time as we'd like for questions or discussion. Um, we'll certainly be available afterward. Um, but we also wanted to give some of you a guide to think through how this may apply to your own situation. So you'll see some questions in boxes throughout that are just opportunities for you to reflect and kind of apply this, connect this to your own situation. So as I'm talking here, you might think about what are some of the challenging behaviors that your child or children may display. The other point we wanted to make is that differentiating among challenging behaviors and symptoms is a really challenging process. It requires input from your medical provider as well as input from your mental health providers. That may also change over time. You may have some things that may begin as a neurological symptom and then after the inflammation and that sort of acute onset crisis phase has passed, those behaviors may stick around just because we are used to doing them and we are in a pattern. And so sometimes then something may shift and we may be looking at it more as a challenging behavior. 
Um, whereas when your child's strep titers are up to here and they are in that acute quasi-encephalitic phase, you're not at the modifying behavior point. So some of these things may change. Um, again, thinking about the fact behavior serves a purpose in general. If you've, again, worked with someone in the CBT um, behavior therapy kind of world, you've probably been told all behavior serves a purpose. We're trying to get something. You know, I want to get attention. We're trying to avoid something. Maybe I want to avoid math class. Maybe I want to avoid putting on that shirt that's really rough. Um, we're trying to escape something. With children who have pandas, sometimes behavior may serve a purpose, but it requires a little bit more nuance and awareness of what the impact of that underlying disease is. So we may not be you know, trying to get attention. We may, be able try, we may instead be trying to get something that we are obsessing about. Behavior may be focused on performing a ritual or performing a compulsion that's really important to the child. Um, avoidance behavior may not be about, I don't feel like going to math class today. It may be about, I'm pretty sure if I walk in the math classroom, a tornado will happen and we will all die. And that's a really different issue, and we have to solve it a little bit different way in terms of how your teacher or how your therapist approach that, talk your child through it. And separation anxiety, of course. So again, take a minute, think about what are some possible purposes for your child's difficult behaviors? What are some of the things that may precipitate it? Okay, and when we talk about that, the sort of fancy word we use is antecedents. So things that may precipitate those challenging behaviors. Those might be chaotic environment, stress, change in routine. Might also be pain. A lot of our children have muscle pain, headaches, stomach pain, sensory issues, obsessive thoughts. If I get in your way and you can't complete the 99 steps that you need to complete before 5 a.m., you know, that may precipitate some behaviors. So think about what are some possible antecedents for your child's behaviors. When we have behaviors, we also want to think about reinforcing consequences. In other words, what kind of things might reinforce or make that behavior more likely to happen next time around? So for example, you know, if I have a tantrum when it's time for breakfast and you pull Lucky Charms out of the cabinet because I hate Lucky Charms, you know, if you put the Lucky Charms away and give me a Pop-Tart, I'll probably have a tantrum again tomorrow to get my Pop-Tart. Right? For a child with pandas, again, that may be a little bit different because the issue may be that we have a real phobia of Lucky Charms or we're convinced you poisoned them. Um, it may not be just that I feel like having a Pop-Tart, which I think is the way people sometimes trivialize children's behavior. Um, and then we could think about negative reinforcement. Maybe we reinforce behavior by removing something. And again, when we talk about reinforcing behavior, that's not a value judgment. Any parent who has had a child with pandas has been in that situation where you know something is probably not on principle the right thing to do. You know long term you're reinforcing a behavior, but you're going to do it anyway because you need to get everybody to sleep. You need to avoid that four-hour tantrum. You need to avoid your child jumping out of the car, whatever it is. So again, not making value judgments, but just thinking about what are some of the things that might reinforce those behaviors so that when we have a few moments of clarity and calm, we can think about how to target them. Okay, and when we think about changing behavior again, we think about removing antecedents, replacing the behavior, and reinforcing it appropriately, not reinforcing undesirable behaviors. For children with pandas, that's a little bit more challenging. Um, the long-term antecedent of a lot of our behaviors is basal ganglia inflammation, and that's pretty hard to remove um, without a medical doctor on board. Uh, you might be able to remove the short-term antecedent. You know, I can take the lucky charms out of my cabinet so that we don't have that tantrum behavior anymore. Maybe we can teach our child a new skill so that they have something better to do. Maybe we teach them to say, mother, I would like a Pop-Tart, please, rather than you know, screaming and crying about the cereal that's on the table. Um, that, as you know, if you've parented a child with pandas, that is really hard to do during those extreme exacerbations. It's a little bit easier to do when things are more stable. You can also stop reinforcing the behavior, and that's a really critical part Again, hard to do when things are in crisis, but really a really important step to do when you have a moment to stop and think about what your long-term strategy is. And I'm going to turn it over to Jan to talk a little bit more about some of these issues. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about removing antecedents. As a parent um, of a child with PANS, removing antecedents is one of your best strategies because we really can't reduce the inflammation we don't necessarily know what the OCD is that's going on in their head or what intrusive thoughts are being played out. Um, so one of the very best things we can do to prevent behavioral problems is to anticipate them 
and remove the, the, the antecedent, the situation that, that triggers it. So one of the things that we can think about is changing location or changing an activity. If, you know, if, they, if they pitch a fit every time they go to grandma's, then maybe they're not going to go to grandma's for a while. But here's the deal. What you don't want to say to them is, since you get so upset whenever we go to grandma's, you, uh, you're not going to go to grandma's for a while. You get to just stay home now. Okay? Instead, you talk to your significant other privately and say, I think we need to just cool down grandma's for a little while. And then you just don't go. Okay? You don't say, I'm going to remove the lucky charms out of the cabinet because I know that you think they're poisons and I don't want you to have a fit. You just quietly remove them and, and you just do that and the antecedent's gone. So quietly removing the antecedent, change, things like changing the location or changing the activity can be helpful. Another thing to really think about, and um, this is like very prominent in like 12-step programs, is that the times that we are most likely to have difficulty is during the times of halt, when we're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And that's true for our kids too. So think about if you have something challenging for your child to do, something that you know is likely to result in a meltdown. Maybe it's math homework. Maybe it's, um, you know, maybe it's taking a bath because they're very sensory defensive or something along those lines. Think about timing that when they're not hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. So, those are, so it's better to time things throughout the day. Think about the time. Similarly with pain, if your child has a lot of he headaches, um, maybe after ibuprofen would be the best time to do math homework. So you might not think about that naturally, but, but those are just some things that you can do to kind of time your day and help things to go a little bit better. And then um, sensory is another piece, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So think about some possible antecedents that can be impacting your child's behavior. So sensory, I'm an occupational therapist. We do a lot of work with sensory processing problems. Uh, we know um, so from some research that we did with Denise Calaprice and Tanya Murphy that about 80% of kids in, during a pan's exacerbation have sensory processing uh, difficulties. And neurologically this makes sense. You all saw the neurologic presentation and you heard about the uh, basal ganglia which, um, which sends input to the thalamus and the thalamus is our largest sensory relay area. So, we know that sensory processing is problematic. One of the things that you may not realize about sensory processing is that it's cumulative. And that means that it accumulates throughout the day. So sometimes you might say, this doesn't make sense. This never bothered him before and it's bothering him today. Or it bothered him yesterday, but it didn't bother him before and now today it's not bothering him. So you really want to think with sensory processing, think about what's built up during the day. So if, if you have, you know, little Sally wakes up in the morning and you know, she slept on some organic sheets with her nice, comfy, worn-in pajamas, and she got a good night's sleep, and she gets up, and she goes downstairs and eats crunchy granola, and it feels really good to chew really hard, and then she goes and she gets dressed for school, and she puts on a little lightly weighted, like, 5 to 10 pound weight backpack, and she hops in the car with mom, and mom gives her a big hug before she gets in the car, and she gets to school, and she skips off into the classroom, and the teacher comes up and says, hi, Sally, how are you today? And Sally says, I'm great. It's going to be a great day. Okay. But the next day, Sally, Sally's mother changed her sheets, and she didn't have her favorite pajamas available, so now she slept on scratchy sheets all night, and her pajamas were kind of itchy, and there were tags in them, and she gets up, and she has to put on that sweater that's kind of itchy, and she goes downstairs, and it's oatmeal and yogurt. Ooh. And so she kind of eats that down, and then she goes, and Mom says, I can't drive you to school today. You have to take the bus, and she gets on the bus, and the, guy, the kid next door smells funny, and somebody behind her is talking, and they're kind of like blowing on the hairs on the back of her neck, and then she gets into the classroom and the teacher says, hi Sally, how are you today? Says, ah, I want to go home, I want my mommy, I don't want to be here. Or she runs under the table or she runs out the door, right? What the heck happened? I do this every day. You may not realize how the sensory system is affecting your child throughout the day. So you really have to be kind of a detective with the sensory system and look at how it's building up throughout the day. So we know that all of these things can feed into the sensory system and when it reaches um, a certain point of overload, it's like it just spills over. It's like a barrel that spills over. And it, when it spills over though, it doesn't empty. It's like there's still stuff in there and then every little drop it keeps spilling over. So what can we do to prevent this? Well, one of the things that we can do is try to avoid the kinds of stimulation that's really obnoxious, that's really annoying for our kids. 
And this is a list of them. Um, these will be posted up on the website. I don't want to go through each one. But you know, loud sounds, fast movements, those can be annoying. I think the biggest thing that um, I want to point out is wet, sticky, and slimy textures. So anything wet and sticky tends to be uh, very annoying. Um, I'll just talk for a minute about fluorescent lights as well, because especially our kids who are on the autism spectrum, but, but even kids not on the spectrum, fluorescent lights have a, a flicker to them and they have a sound that many of us don't pick up on, but many of our kids do, and they can be very annoying for kids. In general, when we're thinking about se the sensory system, deep pressure is easier to tolerate than light touch, and that seems counterintuitive. You know, you have a child who has sensory defensiveness and they're eating something and there's you know, food on their face, and so you take like a little wet cloth and you very lightly and gently wipe that off of them, and they'll be like, yeah. Light touch is harder to tolerate than deep pressure. If you think about like rubbing the hairs on the back of your arm, it kind of makes you go like that. If you're in pain, you, 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 know, you stub your toe, you bang it. Deep pressure actually relieves pain and is very calming. So that can be um, one thing to think about. Dry, rough textures are easier to tolerate than wet or sti sticky textures. So tr dry granola, chewy kinds of dry foods might be easier for kids than something wet like yogurt or oatmeal. So trying to modify the diet that way can be helpful. Giving them a, 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 like a dry, scratchy washcloth when they're washing or a loofah might feel better to them than something very soft. You'd think the soft thing would feel better, but it, it may not. And then self-imposed stimulation is easier to tolerate than stimulation received from others. So when they have that thing on their face, if you put a mirror in front of them and hand them a, like a rough washcloth and they wipe it off themselves, they can really tolerate that much better than you trying to do that for them. Teaching them to bathe themselves, a lot of kids have trouble with hair washing, teaching them to wash their own hair or to, to rub and rub hard, rub your head hard, massage your head, that can be really helpful. These are some examples of things that um, are very calming for kids. So we know deep pressure is very calming. A lot of our kids um, in OT get, wear pressure vests, so vests that are kind of tight. Kids, um, just typical kids who are not receiving OT, I often tell them get like an Under Armour shirt that's just a little too small, so it's a little bit tight, wear that under your clothes, that can be really calming for kids and help them throughout the day. Weighted blankets and weighted vests are very popular, about 5 to 10 percent of body weight. Um, that's good for giving you some deep pressure, self-imposed massage. And then the other thing I want to talk about is uh, proprioception, which is heavy work. And I don't think we think enough about that, but the information that your muscles send to your central nervous system when you're using them actually are very calming. So having kids you know, pick up something heavy throughout the day, having them do some walking, some running, lifting weights. A lot of our kids, especially in exacerbation, are very sedentary. Having time on the treadmill or having time to move would be really good. And the last one is slow rhythmic movement, like rocking in a rocking chair. And um, that could be a really good thing to put in. Uh, putting a rocking chair in their bedroom could be a very good way to help. So when we're helping our children, as we said, we don't always have time to think. You don't always have time to think and plan. And for most of us, how many people in here are, are within the first year of a PANS symptoms? We have a few, a few newbies here, yeah. Okay, so for, for most of us, when that first exacerbation comes on, like you didn't know what was gonna happen. This is not the child that you had. And all of a sudden, you're thrown into crisis. And when we think about crisis, the definition of a behavioral crisis is a behavioral problem that exceeds the resources available. So if you say, I'm, I feel like I'm in crisis, like what does that mean? It means you don't have the resources to deal with whatever is being laid out in front of you now. So what are resources? Money, which how many of you have gone through a lot of money or don't have as much money as you wish you had to be able to, to treat your child? Time, uh, many people have to take time off from work. They don't have the time to, to manage it and get to the doctor's appointments and all of those things. Attention, especially if you have other children that you're also trying to raise and, and not have this affect them. Skills, because as I said before, you weren't born with the skills, you never saw the skills of being a parent of a child with PANS, you're learning those now. And knowledge, because you've all become immunologists, neurologists, <laughs> right? You all have your, your uh, PhD in <laughs> all of these areas. So initially, you're in crisis, and you try to work your way through that. Over time, the goal is to increase your resources 
to decrease the frequency of crisis. You may or may not be able to fix your kid's pans tomorrow. Probably won't be tomorrow. It may, not, it may be fixed in a month, and I, I would be lovely if everybody in here who has a child in crisis right now would be fixed in a month. It may not be a month. It may be longer term. So we want to talk to you now about some things to do to try to increase your resources to try to decrease the crisis and move you into management, and Heather's going to talk about those things. Thank you. First of all, I'm honored to be here um, beyond... I, I can't even tell you because you all are in the thick of it and you know and we know what it's like um, to lose our child and, it, and, and to deal with the behaviors and it's extreme. And um, those of us that are presenting today, I just want to share with you, you know, our background is working with kids, typical kids, you know, typical behavior issues, typical needs. And we all know our kids don't have typical needs. And so everything that we're sharing, we, as, as Jan was saying, you know, we share it with you with the understanding that you're going to take what you can and you're going to deal with your child in the moment that you can. And all of the best cognitive behavioral therapy and applied behavior analysis and all of the best intention when your kid is really sick and flaring isn't going to work. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that until the inflammation is reduced in the child as well. And that's when we start to pick up the pieces again. So that's my first number one big takeaway. Couple things that I really want to stress. One is accessing, increasing your resources. Like Jan was saying, we want to increase our resources so that we're not in crisis. And so, what are some of the resources that we can tap into? What, who in your family or in your social circle can come in and help out so that you can get to the grocery store, so that you can leave for a little bit of time and that you've got a plan with your child that's going to allow you to go and do that? Um, do you have neighbors that can support you as well? Um, community supports that we want to be thinking about accessing because probably most of us never had to access community supports before now. So what are some of the community supports that are available? What are the mental health professionals that we can get into? Um, I don't know about your, all of the states that are represented here, but I know in Washington state getting in with a mental health specialist is anywhere from 12 to 14 months out and I'm in crisis now. So I can't wait for another year of this, right? So who, what other mental health professionals can I access? Can I access them through my school setting? Can I go to the emergency room and simply go in and say, I need resources. I want a list of all therapists. And you start making those phone calls and, and you know, cancel the last appointment so you get into the next one. Um, medical providers, you know, I've had to fire some of my doctors while I was looking for other doctors that were going to get the needs met. And then I loved what I heard earlier today afterwards, go back to your pediatrician or whatever doctor that you fired and say, look, my kid is better now, just for education for them, but also to rebuild that relationship. And then thinking about, um, I heard um, Dr. Latimer saying this earlier, and I was so happy to hear her share this, but it's terrifying to think about calling the police when your child is unsafe either unsafe for themselves or unsafe for other people in the family. And sometimes we have to make that decision. So be proactive, call the police beforehand, bring your plan in, tell them what you're dealing with, let them know, educate them so that if the time comes when you need to call on the police to come in, they know ahead of time what they're dealing with and, they know, and they're not coming in really in an emergency situation. It is we can no longer keep our child safe and we need your support to help us because not everybody's trained to properly secure and restrain their own child. In fact, probably none of us are, um, or most of us are not. So um, have that ahead of time. And then thinking about school personnel, how can you access supports there? I believe that probably every school district in the United States has adopted some kind of training for staff to deal with kids who have challenging behaviors not pan specific but challenging behaviors and if that's the case then those staff have had to be trained in some form of legally compliant and safe um, technique to secure and restrain a child and so go to your school and ask hey if if you provide this training can i as a parent of a child who's having these types of behaviors can i please come and get trained you might be charged a fee, you might not, I, I don't know. Um, I know that I'm advocating in our school district to offer that to parents. I've been advocating for that actually before I had a kid's parents. Um, but definitely now that I have one because I can't imagine doing what I did with my child if I didn't have the skills and training that, that I had for years and years and years. And, and most of us do not. So thinking about those resources, um, obviously paid supports and then systems. How can you educate yourself and how can you have a safety plan and use that safety plan? So the other thing that I really want to focus on, you cannot control the stress response that your child is having. 
You can't control that. They've, you know, even, even if they didn't have inflammation, you can't control it. You can't control the stress response of anybody. You can influence the stress response of others by managing your own. So it's really important that we think about and observe what is our stress response when, when our child is in crisis. Um, and how can we uh, be aware that we're starting to have that? We're flooded with 140 chemicals. Even if, even if it wasn't, uh, even if we didn't trigger, uh, the response didn't trigger initially with us, um, we are flooded with 140 chemicals. Th these, these are the physical reactions we might have and the emotional responses that we might have. And so what skills and strategies do we have to get our stress under control so that we can influence the stress response of everybody else present? The child, our child with PANS, uh, siblings if they have them, our spouses even sometimes, um, so that we can just kind of, I like to think of it as, let's just bring the volume down. So observing what stress looks like in you and then thinking about ways that you can um, manage your own stress. Your self-talk is gonna be really important. Also, what, the way that you're communicating um, with, with your child and with everybody else present, your paralanguage, observing uh, your facial expressions, your body expressions. You, I, I will um, try to keep a generally a neutral face. I kind of joke about it when I'm doing trainings in the school district because I spend a lot of time in the sun and I get these 11s. And so I'd be like, okay, before I go in to respond, I'm just gonna like smooth this out so that I've got a calm, neutral face so I don't come in looking angry. Um, and do I see the situation through the perception of the child? And you heard um, already today many people talking about what this experience is like for our children, and you probably have a good idea of it as well. And so you're going to want to adapt yourself in order to help manage that better. Uh, we heard already how important active listening is, empathizing and validating. Can't stress that enough. This is the time when you want to tell them, I hear that you are feeling this. I loved it. Period. Not comma, but. And then um, these next two slides are pretty self-explanatory. These are all things that, you know, when we're in our worst moments, we do them. And then afterwards, like, ah, really shouldn't have done that. Wish I hadn't said that. That's self-learning so that next time you don't. So just be thinking about what are the triggers that you want to be avoiding um, so that you're not being a part of the crisis situation. Same with escalators, but what escalators might create the potential for crisis to increase even more. Um, and then really, this is, I think, probably the slide I'm going to end on, um, and, th and then we'll just go through the others just for visuals. But this is really powerful visual, right? So if we've got a crisis situation or a child who's experiencing a stress response, we don't want it to be a crisis situation, and they're kind of starting to escalate, and then we intervene or we do the right thing and it kind of tapers off. But if we then try to engage them again or we, we you know, use a trigger or something, it's going to escalate even more and we have this kind of pattern, right? It's that kind of power struggle pattern. So that is not what we want. Instead, we want to be able to help bring that volume down, bring that stress response down for them in that moment. And yes, uh, Patty was talking about there are times when we're intentionally making decisions that we will not be doing long term, but we want to be avoiding the crisis. It's not a part of our long term behavior plan, but for right now, we want to prevent the holes in the wall, the kick down door, the biting, the hitting, the kicking, all of those things that are unpleasant that we're experiencing, um, knowing that we are going to plan long term when they're well to um, deal with those OCD, anxiety kinds of behaviors. So we want to bring the volume down so that we can support them so that their stress response comes down as well. Basic principles, again, you can read through these um, on the slide. These are just things that can help you to um, de-escalate an, an individual that is having a stress response. Um, I would say you know, a couple of the my favorite ones really, oop, I keep wanting to do that. My favorite ones um, that work really well for me is silence <laughs> and giving space and just being present in that moment because oftentimes we can't console our children anyway. And so we just um, use that kind of calm demeanor and, and, and validate and reassure them that we're there to help them and to keep them safe. So um, you heard me talk about the uh, idea that there might be a time when we need to restrict the movement of our child to keep them safe. Really important that we are clear that we should never use restraint um, as a form of punishment or to teach a lesson and we should never use it to prevent behavior that, isn't, that is non-harmful. So we are only ever intervening if um, we are very certain that the child is either going to be unsafe to themselves or to others, um, or to take them to the MRI. 
<laughs> or to get the labs drawn. Um, but that is being done, you know, probably with the support of others. And um, if, if at all possible, if you can get yourself trained in how to do that, you're going to feel much more confident and competent should you need to do that. Um, and, and if the situation at home is so unsafe and you do not feel competent or confident, then by all means, you have already uh, made the contact to call the police to come in if, if that's needed. So um, that's what I'm gonna say about that. And then um, when, when the crisis is over, right? When our children are healing, when they are returning back to baseline, then we're gonna go back to more of our typical cognitive behavioral therapy um, and sometimes applied behavior analysis uh, skills that we had and have. And I heard somebody even talking about exposure response therapy and does that work? And I would tell you that, yeah, it works when your child is not in a medical crisis. And when they're in a medical crisis, I have not um, personally experienced it being effective. Um, but reducing the stress load on my child has been very effective to get through the crisis and to get healing so that now we can use those techniques um, to move past these. Because what we don't want to have happen is medically induced learned behavior. Right? We don't want to um, get stuck ourselves in uh, post-traumatic stress, right? because we all have that, where we're like, oh my god, I'm so afraid it's going to happen that I'm going to prevent it from happening again because it was so horrible. So um, that's where like, family therapy can be very helpful in giving us the skills and the techniques to move back to not new normal, but old normal. And then uh, the, I, the RAP plan, we're not going to talk about it now, but it's a great resource. There's a website here. So I think we're just going to open it up to Q&A.